بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم الصراط الذين أنعمت عليهم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والضحى والليل إذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما قلى وللآخرة خير لك من الأولى والضحى والليل إذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما قلى وللآخرة خير لك من الأولى ولسوف يعطيك ربك فترضى ألم يجدك يتيما فآوى ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فأغنى فأم اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما السائل فلا تنهر وأما بنعمة ربك فحدث سرق الله العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين مولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن سبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد our respected brothers sisters elders السلام عليكم ورحمة الله قاري سلطان is kind of a overdone it with my introduction actually being in uh, their company was pleasure for myself alhamdulillah 
couple of days I stayed in Trinidad, mashallah, brothers were beautiful, uh, the place is beautiful, the unity amongst the Muslims, alhamdulillah. And you know, this is the unique thing. Uh, I come from England, from a place called Birmingham. The Muslim population of Birmingham is approximately 200,000, one city. But what brings me here is one thing, and that is our connection of Iman. That we all recite La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And really, you know, this is amazing bond. This is what you call the Ummah. The Ummah. This is the Ummah that the Prophet وسلم, created, that people from different backgrounds. You had Salman, he was a Persian. You had Suhaib, the Roman. Bilal from Ethiopia, the Ansar, the Muhajirun, and many others. And the Prophet wasallam brought them all together. He brought them all together and he created this one Ummah. But what was the cause and what was the reason of the Ummah? It was this Iman. And the Prophet wasallam said, Alhamdulillahi ala ni'matil Islam wa kafa biha ni'mah. All praise be to Allah on the favor of Islam. And if this was the only favor, only favor that Allah had bestowed mankind, it would have been enough. If Allah had given man no other favor besides the favor of Islam. Now imagine, what does that mean? That means a person, he's got no wealth. He's got no children, no wife. He's got no car. Further, he's got no health. He's got no hands, he's got no feet, he's got no legs. But he leaves this dunya with iman. In the scales of Allah, he is successful. And if he has the wealth of Fir'aun, Pharaoh, sorry, wealth of Qarun, strength of Fir'aun, but he leaves this dunya without iman, without believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he in the scales of Allah is unsuccessful. The Prophet wasallam gave an example of a person, a person who died without iman, died without belief. But this person was a person that Allah had given favor upon favor upon favor. The Prophet ﷺ said nobody else was given dunyawi, materialistic favors like this person was given. Nobody. Can you imagine? And this guy had everything. You know, the riches that you can imagine. He was happy. He had beauty. Everything that you can imagine this person had. The Prophet ﷺ said that nobody else was given the favors like this person was given. But the Prophet ﷺ said that he would have died on disbelief. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he stands in front of Allah on the day of judgment, Allah will say, Enter him into, enter him into the fire of Jahannam, enter him into the hellfire for a moment. In, out, dip out and that's what they will do the angels will take him to the fire they will enter him into the fire and they will bring him out and then he will be brought in front of Allah and Allah will ask him tell me did you compare to that one moment in Jahannam did you experience any moment of pleasure luxury in the dunya and he will say by you oh Allah I had I experienced no luxury no pleasure in the dunya. On the other hand, the Prophet ﷺ said that there will be a person who will be brought in front of Allah. Nobody after the Anbiya والسلام, after the Prophets would have been tested like this person. Nobody. Can you imagine? Being tested, you can't imagine. No exaggeration. You know, a few years ago I was in uh, Gaza in uh, Palestine, Gaza, and this was after the uh, bombing, and we met a man. This man, 
He had six daughters. Six daughters. And the bomb hit his house. Everybody became unconscious. And the father says, I woke up and I was looking for my daughters. Out of those six daughters, five died. He said, I removed the rubble. He said, my eldest daughter was very loved in the area. She was a very loving person. Every night she would go to sleep with her arms around her two younger sisters. Every night. And he said, when we removed the rubble and we found their bodies, I found them in exactly the same situation. Exactly the same position. She had her arms around her two younger sisters. And the brothers who were there began to cry. And the father who had lost the children came up. He stood up and he began to console the brothers. He said, don't cry. For they are by Allah in Jannah. For them is Jannah. He had a little daughter who was about 15 days old when her sisters passed away. Then he sat down and he picked up his daughter, one daughter he had left. He said, by Allah, she is Allah's as well. If Allah wants to take her, Allah can take her as well. This person would have gone far more than the example I gave you. Far more trials and tribulations in the dunya. You know, sometimes we look at our trials and tribulations and we think we're having it rough. We're having it tough. The truth is, if you look at other people, and this is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, he said, look at those who are below you in the dunya and you will remain happy. Look how many people today in the world don't know where their next meal is coming from. Look how many people in the dunya today. I have a, my own nephew. He's about the same age as my, my, my eldest brother's son. He suffers from motor, motor neurons. He's only around about my age. His condition is such that he can't move his arms, he can't move his legs, he can't move any limb in his body. And his state is deteriorating. And just before I went to see him, I had a few things on my mind which were worrying me. When I went to see him, I thought, subhanallah, how ungrateful am I? You look at his state and you look what Allah has given us. Last week, I went to Syria. I was on the Turkish border, one day in Turkish border and the next day I was in Syria. I went to a camp. It was freezing. It was colder than the UK. It, the, the weather temperature was minus. And I went to this camp. There are 10,000 people living in a tent, in tents. Over 20% of those children I saw with my own eyes were walking around in slippers. Can you imagine? No hot water. I had to do pray one salah there. And I had to do wudu. And then we still complain that we ain't got enough. We still don't do the shukr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu said, In the dunya compare yourself with those below you and you will be happy. Because if you compare yourself with those who are more than you, then you will never be happy. What will, you will, what will happen is that you will be on Prozac. You will suffer from depression because people will always have more dunya than you. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if I gave, if man had two valleys of gold, two valleys of gold, he would desire a third. He would want a third. Two is not enough. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, the only thing which will satiate man is the dust in the grave. When he's put in the grave, then only will he be satiated. Then only will his desires stop. And this is life, my dear respected brothers and sisters. Life is short. Go to the graveyard. Look at the, look at the dates on the tombstone. As soon as we came out of the airport, we passed the graveyard. Look at the dates. 1850, 1900. 
you realize that these people spent more time under the grave, uh, under the ground than above it. And that's my and your reality. That is man's reality. That we come into the dunya. Nobody chose to come in the dunya. Did you choose to come in the dunya? Did you choose to be born in a certain place in Trinidad or anywhere else in the world? You didn't choose. It happened. And the day will come that you will leave this dunya and you will not choose the time that you want to go. There's no visa that you apply for my time. I want to go now to Jannah. No visa. It comes. And it comes all of a sudden. And you leave the dunya involuntarily. You came involuntarily. You leave the dunya involuntarily. So what makes you think that you have any right over the period in between? That period, Allah brought you to dunya and Allah will take you one day. But Allah gives you this short period of time. Because Allah wants to see what my servant will do with the life I gave him. Will he remember me? Will he turn towards me? How will he spend his life? Or will he just follow his whims and desires? Will he just follow his whims and desires? And this is a question that we need to ask ourselves. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, a unique, unique community. The brother was telling me 250, Allah Akbar, 170,200 approximately, 250 Muslims. It's actually amazing. It's actually amazing that a community can actually survive and not only survive, thrive like you are doing. But let's never get complacent. There is no such thing as complacency. Let me tell you about a place. It's called Muslim Spain. Muslim Spain was the most progressive society on the face of this earth. There were thousands of masjid in Qurtaba. There were thousands of... There was, they were so progressive that the entirety of Europe would follow them. If you wanted to learn advanced knowledge, the rest of Europe was in the dark ages. If you wanted to learn advanced knowledge, you would actually have to learn Arabic. Even the non-Muslims... Learned Arabic, they learned poetry to a very high level because it was fashionable to follow the Muslims. They would dress like the Muslims. They would act like the Muslims. And for those who know about scholarship, you had people like Imam Qurtabi, Ibn Hazm, Ibn Arabi al-Maliki, Ibn Sina, and uh, how many, many others. But where are they today? Where is Muslim Spain? I take a group every year to Muslim Sp- Spain, well, to Spain, Andalus, and I show them around Andalus. Where is that legacy? Where is that most advanced community on the face of this earth? It doesn't exist. Why? Because people became c- complacent. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم Don't be like those who forgot Allah and Allah made them forget themselves. They forgot Allah and Allah made them forget themselves. Their existence no longer exists. The books of the scholars are there. But where is their families? Where is their families? And this is why my dear respected brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mashallah, has given this, you this unique opportunity, a unique community. But for, for, for it to thrive, we need people of actions. We need people who will learn about their deen, who will be serious about their deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu aminu. O you who believe, 
believe. How is that possible? Either you're a believer or you're a non-believer. And Allah is saying, Oh, you believe, believe. How is it possible? Either you believe or you don't believe. See, let me give you an example. Maybe you'll understand. See, you have a guy who's a bit feminine. You know, he's, he's got feminine characteristics. He's not strong. He's weak. So you say to him, Bro, be a man. Man up. He's already a man. What are you telling him? You are telling him, be a real man. And this is what Allah is saying. He said, oh, you who believe, become true believers. Have a strong belief. Have a solid belief. An unshakable belief. But an unshakable belief comes with effort. It comes with sacrifice. It comes with waking up for the Fajr Salah. It comes with reading the Quran. It comes with calling other people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It becomes, it comes with making Allah your priority in life. That's where it comes from. And that's where believers should be. No matter if you're 2%, 1%, no matter if you're 250, Alhamdulillah, if 250 people became serious on their deen, by Allah, by Allah, you would have a revolution. You know why? Because Allah never judges a group of people by their numbers. Allah judges a group of people by their quality. If you've got 250 people of quality, they're more than a million with no quality. You look at the Battle of Badr, how many Muslims were there? 313. They were facing an army of how many? A thousand. What did they have? They had two horses. That's all they had. Two horses. They had, some of them had sticks in their hand. And the Quraysh, the enemies, they had weapons up to their teeth. Everyone had a horse. Everyone had a camel. But 313 overpowered an army of a thousand. Why? Because these were people of quality. People who were heavy in the scales of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how do you become heavy in the scales of Allah? It's through actions. It's through being serious about the deen of Allah. We have amazing examples in the life of the Prophet sallallahu with da'wah is concerned. How the Prophet sallallahu there was a man called Rukana. Rukana was this man, he, he, he was a wrestler. Nobody could defeat Rukana. What would happen in those days, you would have the marketplaces. And the market, they would have these marketplaces inaugurated once a year in certain places. All the wrestlers of that vicinity would come and they would wrestle with each other. Umar ibn al-Khattab was a wrestler. Khalid bin Walid was a wrestler. But nobody ever defeated Rukana. Rukana was the undisputed wrestler amongst the Arabs. And one day he came to the Messenger of Allah and he said, he said, Oh Muhammad, if you defeat me, I will embrace Islam. And the Prophet said, Seriously? If I beat you, you will embrace Islam? He said, Yes. And the Prophet grabbed him and he threw him to the floor. Never before this day had Rukana been floored. Rukana was shocked. And Rukana stood up and he said, you know what? I won't look in. Give me a second chance. My foot slipped. He came with some excuse. So the Prophet wasallam grabbed him again. And he threw him to the ground. And Rukana is dazed. He's shocked. He's never been beaten before. And the Prophet wasallam said to him, he said, Oh Rukana, hang around with me and I will show you things which are even more amazing than me battering you. But look at this example. You had Rahmat Lil Alameen. You had the greatest of creation, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he was ready to wrestle with people to bring him towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We find it difficult to speak to people. 
He never thought it was beneath him. Why? Because he had a fikr. He had a concern. He knew if anybody left without iman, this, this would be his outcome. This would be his outcome. And he had this concern. So the Prophet ﷺ said, that the person who would have been tried the most, no person before this person would have been tried as much as this person. And Allah, but he would have died on Iman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command the angels, take, take my servant into Jannah for a moment. And they will take him into Jannah for a moment. In, out, dip out. And he will be brought to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet ﷺ said, will ask him, Can you, did you experience any trials and tribulations? Any difficulty in the dunya? And he will say, Oh Allah, in comparison to that one moment in Jannah, I experienced no difficulties in the dunya. My dear respected brothers and sisters, we are people who work for the afterlife. That is our aim and that is our ambition. Obviously we work in this dunya. We make a livelihood. You know, alhamdulillah, al halal earning. But we do the tarbiyah of our children. In small communities, the tarbiyah of the children, the nurturing of the children is the most important thing. Because if you don't give them Islamic knowledge and you give them everything else, if you don't give them good nurturing, you give them everything else. The truth is you've given them a raw deal. Because by Allah, on the day of judgment, the only thing which will count is your actions. Is your actions. And many people, many children who weren't nurtured, they will drag their parents into the fire of Jahannam. Because they did not fulfill the obligation to the children. A man, a man came to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And he said, oh Umar, oh Mir al-Mu'mineen, my son is rude. Speak to him. So Umar radiallahu anhu was Umar. He began to scold him. And the boy said, oh Mir al-Mu'mineen, can I have a word? Let me say something. So Umar said, say. He said, what... When a person marries, what is the right of the child? He asked, what is the right of the child? And Umar anhu said, the right of the child is that when a person marries, he marries a pious woman. He marries a pious woman so that woman can do the tarbiyah. She can nurture that child. She can bring him up in an Islamic environment and vice versa. When a woman looks for a husband, she looks for somebody who is pious. So he said that he looks for a pious wife. And also when the child is born, he gives the child a good name. And thirdly, he nurtures that child. He gives that child a good Islamic education. And the child turned to Umar and he said, Oh, Mirul Mu'mineen, my father married a woman who, from a tribe who were known for their lewdness. And he gave me a name which meant Spider. And as far as Islamic education, he gave me no education. And Umar radiallahu anhu said, he said, he turned to the father, he said, you broke ties with your son before he broke ties with you. You know, we are all, we all get upset. And we should. We all get upset when our children don't listen to us. And we complain, what kind of child are you? I bought you up. I spent on you. I cleaned your nappy. But if Allah, but if the tables were turned, we got to look at our own lives. How are we towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Day and night, we transgress the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Day and night, day and night, we eat the risk of Allah, but we transgress His laws. Allah didn't just nurture us, Allah created us. Every ni'mah and every favor that we have. So if we are transgressing the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we shouldn't be surprised if our children are transgressing against us. 
we shouldn't be surprised because that's how it works. We transgress the laws of Allah and when somebody transgresses our rights, you know, we get upset. So my dear respective brothers and sisters, the most important thing that we can give our children is good education. Now, I don't know what the education system is. I'm hoping it's good. I'm hoping it's good, but, but not just in the masjid, in our homes. Teach them Islamic education. But the first thing is that you must know it yourself to impart it. You must know it yourself. What is the sunnah waking up? The dua. Because, well, when you eat the food, when you, after you finish eating the food, read the dua so the child hears you reading dua, then he will read it. When you go sleep, dua, wake up, dua, go, enter the bathroom. Why, why are all these duas mentioned for? They're mentioned so you constantly remember Allah. You're constantly in the remembrance of Allah. You enter the masjid dua, you start your wudu dua, you go out the masjid dua. Mannerisms. What kind of mannerism are we imparting into our children? But the truth is that many times children will take the manners of their parents. The Prophet ﷺ said, أَكْمَلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِيمَانًا أَحْسَنَهُمْ خُلَقًا Those believers who are the most perfect in their iman, the perfect in their belief are those who have the best character, who have a good character. Muslims are meant to be people who are radiant in their character. Muslims are meant to be people who are different. They are meant to be different. Because we had a Prophet ﷺ who was different. He taught us teaching Islam which was different. You look at the character of the Prophet ﷺ. How the, how the Sahaba anhum speak about the character. They say regarding the Prophet ﷺ. Every Sahabi says, When I was in the company of the Prophet ﷺ, I felt that I was the most beloved to him. I felt that I was the most beloved to the Prophet ﷺ. They say when, we would, when he would speak to him, he would turn around, face us. There was no man who was more busier than the Messenger of Allah. He had the responsibility of humanity upon his shoulders. But when he would speak, he would turn fully. They say when we would shake his hand, he would not pull his hand back until we would release his hand. Amr ibn al-As anhu says that one day I was in the company of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and he showed me so much love. That I felt that I was the most beloved person to the Prophet ﷺ. So I asked him, I said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, am I better than Abu Bakr? And the Prophet ﷺ said, No. He said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, am I better than Umar ibn al Khattab? And the Prophet ﷺ said, No. He said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, am I better than Uthman ibn Affan? And the Prophet ﷺ said, No. And Umar ibn As says, I regretted asking the Messenger of Allah this question. But he says, that the love that the Messenger of Allah afforded me, the love that He showed me, was such that I felt that I was the most important person. And my dear respective brothers, you know, this is what makes Muslims special. Alhamdulillah, we all pray our salah. Alhamdulillah. Because we should pray our salah. Because Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu said, you know, Umar was passing away. You know the story of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar was leading the salah and somebody stabbed him. Abu Lu'lu stabbed him. And Umar is falling to the floor. He's falling to the floor and he grabs the hand of Abdul Rahman ibn Auf and he makes him stand on the prayer mat. Even in that state, he makes him stand on the prayer mat. And Abdul Rahman ibn Auf finishes the Fajr salah quickly. And then they turn to Umar ibn al-Khattab. And it's long, I'll make it brief. And Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu says... He says he become unconscious and then he gains consciousness. And then he says, first question, he said, have the believers completed their prayer? And he, they said, yes, Umar al-Mu'mineen. And Umar radiallahu anhu said, good, because there is no place in this deen for that person who doesn't pray. The first thing that you will be asked on the day of judgment will be your prayer. 
Aisha radiallahu anha says that the messenger of Allah, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was at home, look at the character of the messenger of Allah. He said he would do all the, all the normal things that husband did. When he's, he, would, he would sew his own clothes. He would sew his shoes. He would help with the domestic chores. But she says, soon as the salah time would start, it was as though he didn't know us anymore. Because now he's standing in front of his creator. This was the importance of salah. Umar, while he's stabbed, he becomes unconscious. And he doesn't gain consciousness for a very long time. And somebody said, if, give the adhan. I swear by Allah, if he has an iota of life left in him, when he hears the adhan, he will respond. And they give the adhan. And no sooner do they give the adhan, Umar radiallahu comes around. This was the importance of salah. But the truth is, your salah is between you and Allah. Your salah is between you and Allah. Nobody outside is interested in your salah. Your fasting is between you and Allah. But character, the way you behave as a Muslim, the way you hold yourself, that is what people want to see. They want to see that character which they read or they heard about in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. That is a difficult thing in all honesty. To remain with an upright character is not an easy thing. But it's the thing that if a person fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if a person knows that he's going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he will control him. And just as important, it is important for us to disseminate this into our children. This Islamic knowledge is a fard upon us to teach our children. If we could give them everything else, everything, you give them a PhD, you give them a Ferrari, you give them a house on the beach, but you deprive them of deen, then you have given your children a raw deal. One of our teachers, Sheikh Abul Hassan Nadwi, rahimahullah, he gives this example, and it relates well on being on such a beautiful island like this. He says there's a few young men who go on a holiday, educated young men. So they take a boat and they go out fishing. And whilst they are going fishing, they meet this fisherman. And they say to this fisherman, old man, they say to him, he said, oh, old man, they want to have a laugh with him. They said, oh, old man, do you know anything about algebra? And the old man said, algebra? Never heard of it. Never heard of it. They say to the old man, they said, oh, old man, do you know anything about geography? Do you know where London is? He said, old oh, man, said, Ge- geography, all I know is from my house, from my house to my sh- uh, boat, and then out again to the sea. That's all I know. He said, oh man, one of them, another one said, oh man, you know anything about English? He said, ah, English, I know a bit of English. He said, English, he said, I go, you go, Glasgow. He said, English, I know. So one who was a bit more cheekier than the rest, he said, old man, indeed, Old man, indeed, you have wasted a great portion of your life. So the old man's upset. He goes away. Later on, they are afflicted by a storm. And all these young men are sitting in the boat and they're shaking. And the old man comes past. And the old man turns to the young boys and he sees them in the boat. They're shaking. He says to them, most likely they came from a place like London, you know, they, they weren't brought up on a, mashallah, beautiful island like yours. The first time and the only time I, subhanAllah, I heard of the island, St. Lucia, yeah? yeah? Was that one of my friends came to play cricket here. That's the first time I ever heard about it. And Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me the tawfiq to meet you, mashallah, blessed brothers. So they say, he says to them, he says, young man, do you know anything about swimming? And they say, no. So he says to them, I may have wasted a great portion of my life, but you have wasted your entire life. Because the only thing which counts is here is if you can swim or if you can't swim. And by Allah, 
The only thing on the day of judgment, the only thing which will count is your actions. And if you have given your children everything, but you did not give them good actions, good tarbiyah, good nurturing, good Islamic knowledge, then you have given your children a raw deal. As far as how your children come out, that is not in your hands. You try your best. You try your best. That's it. Uh, you, uh, we have children of the Anbiya, the prophets, which went astray. But the obligation is upon you. The obligation is upon you to you know, nurture those children. Teach those children good character. You know, in your house, have a bit of ta'aleem. Sometimes, sometimes what happens, and this is unfortunate reality, I hope you know, this place is different, but the vast majority of the Muslim world, often the TV set has a greater impact on the child than the parents do. The child spends more time with the box or the PSP than he spends with mommy and daddy. In many instances, that child is a yatim. You know what yatim is? You guys know what yatim is? Hands up who know yatim. Yatim is an orphan. It's Arabic for orphan. That child is a yatim. Why is it yatim? Because the parents have no impact on that child's life. Imam Shawki says, In the yatim. He said, a yatim is that person that you will see that the mother has forsaken her for duty to the child. She can't handle the child, she just bungs him in front of the TV. She can't handle the child, she's got no time, she want to watch a soap opera. Okay. Give him the PSP. And he's there for hours vegetating. You know, she wants to go out with the friends. Leave him in front of the box. Daddy. Daddy's always aspiring. You know I got a. I had a bicycle. Now I got a car. Now I want a bigger car. Then I want a X5. And I want a bigger house. And a bigger larger house. And before you know it. And this is a reality. I have children myself. Before you know it. Your children are 15, 16. And you realize, you look back at your life. How much time did you spend with your children? The most precious thing is spending time with your family. The best is most precious thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qū anfusakum wa ahlikum nara He says, save your family and your children. Yourself and your children from the fire. If every single person worked on their families, on their children, on their wife, the wife worked on their husband, worked on their children, we would have a harmonious community. Allah says, save yourself and your family from the fire. Let me give you an example. You go home one day as a father, as a parent. And you see, you see some smoke coming up. From a distance and you're driving and you're coming closer to your house and the smoke is coming closer until you reach home and you realize that smoke, that fire is coming, emanating from your house. And you rush out because your wife and your children are in the home and you rush out. And you look around and you see that all that your wife and all your children are out. They're not in the house. And then you look up at the house. And from the window you see that one of your children is still in the home. The house is blazing. And you see through the window that one of your children are still in the home. And, and, and the child is crying out. Mummy, daddy, what do you do? What are you going to say? W- would any of you say, sorry, sorry my beloved, but you know I got mama and I got the other children to look after. They're my priority. If I, something happens to me, who's going to look after? No father, no mother would do that. You would rush into the house to save your child. 
So then what happens when it's to do with the fire of Jahannam? When the afterlife? Where's our concern there? Why don't we become people, you know, who, who do the tarbiyah of our children? Who learn about the deen ourselves. We are people who are meant to have goals, big goals. We are, we are not people who have small goals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us people who aspire. But we aspire for the right reason. We aspire for the right reason. We want to make a change. We want to make a difference. We, we want this ummah, you know, this ummah to be an ummah of quality. We want this ummah to be an ummah which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about in the Quran. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas ta'maruna bil ma'roof wa tanhuna anil munkar. You are the best of people taken out for the benefit of humanity. So we become people who have a work ethic in education. Not in education, we top. In education, we top. We make sure our children are top. In Islamic studies, we make sure we're top. In character, we make sure that we are different. And that's what Muslims should be like. We should have a serious work ethic. You know what they say? The Japanese. They say, you know what the Japanese work ethic is? The Japanese say that if he can do it, I can do it. If nobody else can do it, then I must do it. You know what they say, what the Middle Eastern and the Muslim work ethic is? They say, say, Wallahi, if he can do it, let him do it himself. <laughs> ya Habibi, if nobody can do it, how you expect me to do it? That's not what a Muslim work ethic is like. Muslims are meant to be people who are heavy. Besides a few Muslim countries, that is exactly what the work ethic is like. Illa mashallah. Just a handful. That is not the Muslim work ethic. Muslims are meant to be high achievers. Muslims are not second best. The Prophet wasallam was sitting. The Prophet wasallam said to the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, and I'll finish here and then we'll have a little question answers. The Prophet sallallahu said <coughs> to the Sahaba, he said, he said to the Sahaba radiallahu he said, when you ask for Jannah, what kind of Jannah you ask for? Tell me, what kind of Jannah did he say? Jannah al firdaus the highest Jannah. Because second best is not good enough. You know, you read the dua and everybody should read this dua after every salah. رَبَّنَا حَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيُّنٍ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا O oh Allah, give us from our children and our partners and our children the coolness of our eye. رَبَّنَا حَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيُّنٍ O oh Allah, give from our partners and our children that which makes my eyes cool. That when I see them, my eyes become cool. I become happy. And then, وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama And make us the imams of the muttaqeen. Allah Akbar. This is the dua that we make. Make us the imams of the muttaqeen. Of the pious. Make us the imams. We aspire for high. Our aspirations as believers are meant to be high aspirations. You know this dua, رَبَّنَا حَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَالذُّرِيَاتِنَا O oh Allah, give us from our partners. That which is the coolness of our eyes uh, and from our partners and children. My wife said she'd been reading this dua since the age of 12. Since the age of 12, after every salah, she used to make this dua. Oh Allah, give from my husband that which is the coolness of my eyes. I said, listen, that's one dua which Allah didn't accept because you got me as a husband. <laughs> But this is what believers are meant to be. And finally, my dear respected brothers and sisters, you know, our role model is nobody else than the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is our role model. That is what is we, that's who we want to be with in the hereafter. There's a beautiful story where one day great wealth comes into the Muslim land from Bahrain. Never had so much wealth 
ever come into the Muslim land as it had come on that occasion. Never before. And the Prophet wasallam he gathers the Sahaba and he says to them, take. And they take as much as they want. They would come on message of Allah, I need this. The Prophet ﷺ would say, go. As Anas ibn Malik anhu says that the message of Allah didn't have the word no in his vocab. Anybody ever asked the message of Allah, he gave. He gave. Some Sahaba came and they took so much that they couldn't even carry it. They couldn't even carry it. And next to the Prophet ﷺ, there's a Sahabi called Rabi ibn Kaab al-Aslami radiyallahu anhu. And Rabi ibn al-Kaab is just quiet. He doesn't say a word. So the Messenger of Allah turns to Rabi and he says, Oh Rabi, Rabi, you ask, what do you want? And he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, if I ask you, will you give me? Will you grant me? And the Messenger of Allah said, Ask and inshallah I will grant. And, he, and Rabi says, O Messenger of Allah, As'aluka murafataka fil jannah. He says, O oh Allah, O oh Messenger of Allah, I, uh, the only thing I want is your companionship in jannah. Nothing else. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Awa ghayra thalik. Is there anything else that you desire for? The wealth. And Rabbi replied, Huwa thak. That's what I want. Nothing else. I want to be with you in jannah. And that's what we want as believers. You know, we want to be with the Messenger of Allah, our role model. But the Prophet ﷺ also said, Al Mar'uma man ahab, man will be resurrected with the one that he loves. Whoever you love in this dunya, you will be with him on the day of judgment. If you love the celebrities, you will be resurrected with them. If you love the rap stars, you will be resurrected with them. If you love if you love your bosses and you will suck up to your bosses and you don't care about the laws of Allah, then you will be resurrected with your bosses on the day of judgment. But if you made the Prophet ﷺ your role model, the Prophet ﷺ said, Al Mar'u Ma'aman Ahab, a man came, and I'll finish here. The Prophet ﷺ was just about to begin the salah. And he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, when is the final hour? When is the final hour? And the Prophet ﷺ said, what have you done? So he finished his prayer. And after the prayer, the Prophet ﷺ turned around. And he said, who asked that question? And he said, oh me, your message of Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, ma adatta laha? What have you prepared? What have you prepared for the final hour? And he said, oh message of Allah, I don't have many salahs, many prayers. I don't have many fasts. This doesn't mean that he didn't pray his father's prayer, no. Or that he didn't fast his father's fast, no, he did that. But he didn't pray like many other sahaba did, many nuafil, many sunan. He says, O Messenger of Allah, I don't have many prayers, I don't have many fasts, but one thing I know, I love Allah and His Messenger. And the Prophet said, Al Mar'u Ma'amman Ahab. He said, man on the day of judgment will be resurrected with he who he loves. And Anas ibn Malik anhu says that when the Sahaba heard this, that they would be with the Messenger of Allah, he says, after iman, after belief, nothing gave them so much happiness than knowing that in the hereafter they would be with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those that who have a strong belief. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those that on the day of judgment we are resurrected with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make your community prosper. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you grow strength upon strength. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase your numbers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the ability to become da'is, people who call others to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make your children pious, children who are the coolness of your eyes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always keep us together. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as He's brought us here together today, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunite us on the day of judgment. Jazakumullah khaira for giving me this opportunity. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Yeah.
كفارة للخطايا ذهبت يوما إليه بأدمعي وشقائي